Welcome to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on Jewish history, the Bible, Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. Find out more about David's upcoming classes, publications, and other recorded lectures by visiting davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. This afternoon, we're going on a uh, turbocharged hydrofoil. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about a lot of women. Uh, I'll write them on the board and we've got notes uh, to indicate more or less what I think I'm going to speak about. If you recall, last week, uh, one of the things I focused on was uh, four women from the 20th century. I talked about uh, Bertha Pappenheim, I talked about Henrietta Zold, I talked about Golda Meir and I talked about Hannah Arendt. And for, the, for me, those four represented, uh, for whatever reason, four very, very... Uh, influential uh, women in Jewish history of the 20th century, but I did say that as soon as you were to go to a level beyond that, uh, you would open the floodgates. And uh, even just trying to be really, really strict in looking at women that made major contributions to history, either general history or Jewish history in the 20th century, uh, I couldn't it was very, very difficult to leave people out that made serious contributions, and it turns out we're going to be talking today, just in the 20th century, uh, about uh, over 22 women. That means that I can only spend three or four minutes on each, and what, I, what I'm... T- no, 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 don't worry, because really, the aim of this is really to introduce us to uh, the huge scale of the involvement of women in 20th century Jewish history. And uh, it goes without saying that if any of the names that we do discuss really interest you, obviously some of them I'm going to be spending more time on and some of them maybe a little less time as we, as we scan through it. But before I even get to those 20 or more women, I want to make mention of a couple of women from previous stages in history uh, that I maybe missed out. There's two women that have come to light recently really to me in the last week, one of whom was I mentioned to be by a member of, uh, of the evening uh, group uh, who said, have you heard of this person? And I really didn't know much about this person and I kind of looked into them. And that person, uh, and, and the other one, was recommended in a history of Jewish women by one of the women I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, uh, the, just very, this is very quickly, don't get confused. This is something, uh, w- the, there's a woman... Uh, Amazingly, because you remember that we spoke about the 16th century as the century of the Jewish woman, and we looked at women that were coming from the the West, uh, from Spain and Portugal towards the centre of the Jewish world and towards the Ottoman Empire. Women like uh, Benvenita Brabanel. We looked at women like Donna Grazia, and we also looked at women in the Ottoman Empire, especially under the Vida Sultanate and so on. And we looked this amazing century of women. Well, there's another woman that's really, really significant. We once again we don't have too much time, especially since today I'm talking about the 20th century, but her name, and really astonishing, and when I do the 16th century again, this is going to have to be in more in depth, but we're talking about a woman called Rivka Tiktina, uh, from Tiktin in Poland, uh, who, <laughs> 16th century, I mean, she dies around 1550, she is a woman who has written a book called uh, Meneket Rivka, which is a serious anthology of ethical and Gaddic literature. This was published as a book, and it is, she published it in Yiddish, and it is, in fact, the first Yiddish book, in fact, perhaps even the first published book that we know of by a woman in Jewish history. And she is living in Poland, amazingly. And this is really before Poland takes off as a centre Uh, of Jewish culture. It's just starting to get going and already we see women at the forefront of publishing and writing. The other woman that was brought to my attention uh, by someone in the evening class was in fact uh, a very interesting and we don't know much about it. This is a very recent discovery of historians and they are still trying to poke around and find out who she was exactly and what was happening. What we do know about her is her name was Catherine. That was probably an adopted secular name. Rachel was probably her first, her actual given name. Uh, da Costa. Anyone come across Catherine Da Costa? She lived in, uh, we're talking, uh, she's born in, she's mostly 18th century, she was born in 1679 
and I think she dies in 1756, if I recall. Uh, she is she's living in London. She is the first Jewish painter that we know of. She is a portrait painter. She painted miniatures and highly, highly regarded in her own time. A Jewish woman who became at the forefront of what was going on in portrait painting in England in the first half of the 18th century. So a very, very interesting addition to what we've spoken about so far. And I, had I been more aware of them at the time, I would have put them in uh, when we discussed those issues. Yeah, there's not a lot that we know beyond some very, very basic stuff. And there's not many of her paintings that still exist. But, uh, just, well, and when we talk about these women, even if we can't go into depth, just knowing about them increases our awareness of how the status of women and the role of women has uh, evolved throughout uh, history and especially in the last 500 years what we've seen is the many many women frustrated from being able to partake in the men's world of of the intellect of commerce uh, of men. some women did break through those but many women talented women were diverted into the arts and that's why we've seen so many women poets and artists and so on. We've looked at women poets, we're going to look at more poets today. But that's quite interesting that uh, we have someone arising already in the visual arts. All right. <laughs> now today, I'm smiling, you're not, because I know where I'm going with this. We're going to talk about a lot of women and I want us to get kind of a pattern of where we're going. Uh, it will be confusing enough for you and imagine how it is for me. I'm holding the biographical details of quite a few women in my head and I'm hoping that I can get through as many of them as I can. So, before we get to the 20th, I want to talk about a very, very important Jewish woman, I think extremely important and, and someone that perhaps in this country we're not as aware of, an 18th century woman who was born to a very, very established American Sephardic family. We know that the Sephardic families were among the first Jews to arrive in America and establish congregations. Her great-grandmother was already born in New York in the 1750s. So we're talking about someone from very... Start. So by this time, several generations on, the family is still very Jewish. They're not marrying out. They're Jewish, but they're pretty culturally assimilated into establishment American life. And she grows up, gets a good education, as good an education as, uh, as a girl can get in, uh, in North America, in a well-established family at the end of the 19th century. And she decides that she will go into literature and become a writer and a poet. And uh, so she does. And she's actually, uh, she's born in, uh, I'll tell you who, she, who am I talking about? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Very, very good. Very good. I'm talking about Emma Lazarus. And Emma Lazarus uh, is born around 1849. And in the 1880s, uh, she's already established herself as a fairly front rank poet. You know, she's corresponding with Longfellow and all these other American dudes of the 19th century. And she's uh, written a couple of published works, anthologies of her poetry, very respected. And then she reads mm -hmm. Daniel Deronda by George Eliot. And she is inspired towards an empathy in relation to Russian Jews who are seeking to flee Tsarist Russia and refugees and flocking to America. And she goes down to the docks and starts working with these refugees. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't just talk about it intellectually. She actually gets deeply involved in that and starts reassessing and re-realizing her Jewish roots and her Jewish identity. Very, very important to her and even is among the first, I mean, years before Herzl, is amongst the first to call for a Jewish homeland and using her influence and her literary voice to talk about this. And then she writes a poem about refugees and about coming to America called The New Colossus. And The New Colossus, which was really written in honour of this amazing statue that the that the American government had acquired from France and had planted, uh, you know, at the, at the entrance to the harbour uh, in New York. And they took her poem, uh, The New Colossus, which includes the line, you know, give me your huddled masses that yearn to breathe free, took that and put it as the plaque on the Statue of Liberty. 
And that is Emma Lazarus. She died quite young, 1887, 1888, I believe. But uh, very, very significant front rank poet. And her words are memorialized today. And that is a Jewish woman. And not just a Jewish woman, a Jewish woman whose entire creative output became completely influenced by her notions of her Jewish identity and her empathy for other Jewish people who were fleeing from, from worse situations. So an amazing woman, I think just someone that we should mention. We're going to talk about a lot of poets, but she is uh, right in the front rank of the women uh, I want to talk about today. There's one woman that some of you may know is really where I wanted to start the 20th century, although she's really at the end of the 19th, but her influence is in the 20th. And I, in, in kind of uh, thinking about this talk, I'm just really just amazed this particular person, but the women, that all the women we're going to talk about today are remarkable. But I'm amazed that we just don't know more and we're not more aware and we don't actually digest who these women are and just how they influence Jewish history. This is a woman that was born in Germany. Her name, as we now know it, and I'm just very interested to see if anyone is familiar. This is a seriously influential Jewish woman, and I hope by the, by the end of this talk, so by the time I've gone through all the other women after this woman, you will come back and you will realize just how important this woman's contribution is. Her name is Nahida Ruth Remy Lazarus. Anyone familiar? She was born Anna Maria Concordia. Now, I'm not sure if Concordia is, was her family name or whether that was a name that she was <coughs> given, uh, is one of her given names, but she was born into a very well-respected, upper-middle-class German Christian family. She was not born a Jew. But from an early age, with a very, very good education that she was given, and once again, someone diverted into the arts, into writing, found a place for herself in, in literature as a critic and as a reviewer, and also writing her own uh, material. She was attracted to Judaism, intellectually, but that didn't really have a huge effect on her. And she married a guy called Remy, that was his family name, and he died a few years later and so once she was widowed and, uh, and a bit free she pursued her writing more and also pursued her interest in Judaism. I'll write her name, Nahida. Now Nahida was not her name, Nahida was her mother's name but she adopted her mother's name after her mother died. Ruth, you'll understand why Ruth, Remy, that's Lazarus. <laughs> She wanted to learn more about Judaism and she started going to classes and given this ties into a whole other cultural phenomenon that was happening in Berlin at the time where there was this revival of Jewish culture. People were uh, talking about how they wanted to run classes and workshops for people that wanted to know more about Judaism. Judaism in Germany towards the end of the 19th century had become a very, very kind of dry and uninteresting topic. And yet there was a certain amount of young people that wanted inspiring teaching about Judaism. Uh, and there were some older academics and intellectuals who, at the end of distinguished careers, had decided to go back and learn more for themselves about Judaism uh, and teach and so on. So she went to these classes under a retired professor called, uh, famous in his own right, and it's not so, called Moritz Lazarus. And she studied with him for many years. And he was much older than her. She's only in her 30s, and I think he's probably in his 70s, 60s or 70s, he's much older. But nevertheless, a bond developed between them as teacher and pupil. She learned a tremendous amount for him, became a huge admirer of his edited some of his works and a, obviously a bond developed between them, a bond that grew into, into love and eventually they married. However, before they married and she converted to Judaism, she converted to Judaism with Lazarus's guidance. Now, before she converted, before she married Lazarus uh, in the mid-1890s, she wrote a book called 
the Jewish woman. She was still a Christian. She wrote a book called The Jewish Woman, which expressed her whole philosophy and admiration for the idealized concept of the Jewish woman. Her argument was, and this is a huge contribution to a debate that's going to go on till today and beyond, about the role of Jewish women, uh, the spiritual and cultural and religious role of Jewish women in Jewish society. She argued that gender is something that really itself is an ingrained facet of human society. This is not about equality because men and women are fundamentally different. I'm not saying this is an argument everyone's going to buy, but that's it. The men are men and women are women. But just like any other facet of human life, gender, just like anything else, the whole purpose of Judaism is to elevate that human concept. So you don't reject gender in your pursuit of equality. You elevate the concept of gender so that men have things that men do to make them holy and women have things that women do. And then she writes very, very beautifully about it. I mean, it's not even Jewish yet, about what the concept of a Jewish woman is. So I had a look at the Jewish woman, which is an amazing text. In, in the course of the book, there are many chapters devoted, <laughs> kind of like something like, I wish I'd known this before I even began uh, this series. It's an unbelievable overview of women in Jewish history. And all of the obscure, amazing women that we have spoken about in this series, she talks about. In fact, she's the one that actually highlighted to me Rivka Tiktana, who I wasn't even fully aware of. All of the women that we've spoken about, including Esperanza Malchi, she talks about. She talks about Sarah Kopia Sulam. She talks about Sarah, the wife of Shabtai Tzvi. And amazingly, I, just, I, I wanted to share this. This is not going to... I, I wanted to share this. This is an amazing story that she tells because she talks about some correspondence of the 19th century uh, poet Heine, some of you will be familiar with Heinrich Heine. He converted to Christianity, a famous Jewish poet. <coughs> and Heine writes somewhere in correspondence to someone, he's writing about his ideal of the Jewish mother. He's talking about a Jewish mother that he knows. And this Jewish mother can't go to sleep at night unless she's done a good turn for someone during the day. She's done a mitzvah, she's helped someone out. Otherwise, that's not a day for her. So Heine was extolling how this concept of the Jewish mother is this amazing concept. Rami Lazarus points out that, in fact, the mother that Heine was talking about is the mother of Giacomo Biermeyer. Who is familiar with Giacomo Biermeyer? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Giac who was Giacomo Biermeyer? Who was Biermeyer? In the first part of the 19th century, huge opera composer. Right? And unique because in that entire society, he not only was Jewish, he stayed Jewish. And he was very upfront with his Jewish identity right throughout his career. Huge. And so, Biermeyer, so he, Remy Lazarus, not Heine, Remy Lazarus t tells this amazing anecdote that on the night, it was in Paris in 1830, on the night of the opening, like the premiere of his most famous spectacular work, Robert the Devil, and... and and like the crowds are screaming and storming because it's amazing and it's just finished. And, you know, everybody's standing up to rapturous applause. At that moment, someone rushes up to Biermeyer with a letter. And it's a letter from his mother. And he rips it open. Right. And he opens it up. And in that letter, she says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. Love your mother. Right? So she, of course, talks about how this is kind of like, you know, this combination of spiritual connection at the same time as drawing these immense wells of nachas and all the rest of it. So I thought it's ironic that during the 20th century, the stereotype of the Jewish mother becomes a kind of a, a subject of comedy in a way right uh, and yet 
for her, not even Jewish yet, she saw the concept of the Jewish mother as the highest expression of ideals in spirituality and talks extensively about how women play this role as mothers, as daughters, as wives, as sisters in every aspect of their existence. Phenomenally influential book and went on to play kind of a major role in the development of the status of women in Judaism in the 20th century. A woman called Deborah uh, Malamud wrote a book in 1927 that some of you might have seen about Jewish women called The Three Pillars. Anyone seen that book? Okay. That book, The Three Pillars, went on to become kind of like the underlying uh, philosophical framework about women for the whole of conservative Judaism in America. It became a very, very well-known book, and that's highly influenced by, by the book. So she marries Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus passes away. She edits all his things, and then she lives into the 20th century. But just a remarkable uh, person, a convert uh, to Judaism that went on to have a serious influence on the, on, the, on the level of women. So th- I wanted to start with her because we're going to come back to looking at the role of women in Judaism a little later. But uh, there's two women I need to talk about that just briefly that really, if I didn't, some of you would be sitting there going, well, why didn't he mention her? But these two women are contentious and I'm mentioning them because they're important. Remember I said at the very very beginning of this series some we're going to talk about some women that are great because of the contributions they make to human society or Jewish history generally and the fact that they're women is incidental and there are some women who make contributions as women. Well these women made tremendous contributions as women but they're not always counted as part of Jewish history because Jewish concerns were not necessarily at the forefront of their mind. They are world figures, if you like, but they are Jewish by virtue of their birth, by virtue of their upbringing, which in most cases they rejected in order to throw themselves into uh, human affairs. Some people are able to take their Jewish values and their Jewish identity and go into the world and become great, and some people need to have some kind of recoil effect against their Jewish background in order to become who they are becoming. So these two women are huge in politics in different parts of the world and for different, very, very different ideological reasons. Probably the, the two are, and they're both famous. And some of you will have heard of at least one or if not both of these women. One is, of course, Emma Goldman. And Emma Goldman was regarded, certainly for the first part of the 20th century, she was known officially, I'm talking like by the government, as the most dangerous woman in America. She was an anarchist. So she wasn't just an anarchist, she was an anarchist and a feminist a feminist anarchist or an anarchist feminist. And she, of course, was highly instrumental in coalescing and organising the anarchist movement in the early part of the 20th century and the late part of the 19th, the early part of the 20th century. Well, remember that it was the anarchists who actually assassinated President McKinley and that, in fact, uh, she was arrested for that. Uh, She didn't play a part in that. But she was actually, even though she had American citizenship, she was deported. to Russia, which, where I think she was born. Uh, she came back. Uh, but interestingly enough, and if we want to take some pride in the role of Jewish women, even though her, after her childhood, her Jewish identity was not a significant factor for her, if anything, she would have been quite probably negative towards uh, Jewish ideals because she was so rampant in her anarchic feminism. But she was, and this is something we can only kind of appreciate in today's right-on culture, if we look back at that. She was the first person in America to defend uh, the rights of homosexuals and lesbians. So in terms of we talk today about gay rights and the rights of gay people, uh, she was the first. I mean, you can imagine in, like, what, 1905 to get up and start defending the rights of people to sexuality and that people are born different and we must respect their different preferences is phenomenally ahead of her time and ahead of that generation's expression. So that, that's a very, very interesting facet. And the other, the other extremely uh, acute political figure, also a Jewish woman who, once again, not really going into Jewish history so much but more into uh, world political history, 
is someone that I'm, if you haven't heard of Emma Goldman, then you certainly may have heard of this person. And that, of course, is Rosa Luxemburg. And I can already hear the yeses. And Rosa Luxemburg, who we can also talk about, completely different political view from Emma Goldman, uh, whereas Emma Goldman was an anarchist, Rosa Luxemburg was a socialist and a communist. She was in Germany. She was probably the, the principal communist activator and theorist right in the early decades of the 20th century. She was, in fact, executed in 1919, about a year after the, the First World War, when Germany had a huge crackdown on all of its uh, intellectual and political dissidents in various ways. Germany uh, wasn't just uh, a mess after the Second World War, I can tell you, it was certainly a mess after the First World War and Rosen Luxemburg's ideas. But she's regarded by communist theorists as a very, very significant contributor to uh, communist ideas. And certainly in terms of German socialism, is still held by many as an icon of radicalism and uh, rejection of the values of capitalism and the uh, destruction that it, uh, it wreaks on society. So Luxemburg is, uh, is a very, very big figure. So I just wanted to cover these two because they're Jewish women and they're very, very important, uh, but they don't make contributions per se in Jewish history. But now I want to get down to the uh, sharp end because I want to do about 11 or 12 of these women before we have a break, and then we're going to do more. And like I said, not all of these women will interest everyone in this room, but some of them will, and some of them will just spark something, and I invite you to do further research. We've talked before in preceding centuries about women who have expressed themselves poetically. And so you might think, well, so many of the great poets, women poets in Jewish history, really belong to earlier ages. And sometimes we don't realize that the 20th century was an amazing century for poetry, Jewish poetry, and why would that be? What, what is the massive, massive impetus that happens in the 20th century that you think would give rise to a whole revolution in poetry? Well, women's rights is one thing, but, we actually, but in fact, we don't necessarily need to see women's rights to see women in poetry because we've seen women in poetry already since the 16th century. So why? Well, well I'll tell you. And as soon as I tell you, you'll go, oh, of course. Right. It's just basic education that women True, but women were getting good education. The women that became poets, not all women. We've already seen for a couple of hundred years. No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I'm going with this and you'll understand. It's because in the 20th century, we have a new language. The rise of Hebrew. The 20th century is the century of the rise of spoken and written Hebrew. Well, written had been around for a long time, but a total new revival in this language called modern Hebrew that, of course, Eliezer ben Yehuda basically creates and diffuses and distributes in the very early part of the whole, you know, the first Aliyot, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And so people are speaking Hebrew, and the Zionists are speaking Hebrew in Europe, Zionists are speaking Hebrew in Palestine. Hebrew is on the rise. By the time the state's created in 1948, we have a living, breathing, used language that is the language of the population. And we have kids born there that have never spoken any other language. And how do you think that happened within 40 years, if not by miracle? Hebrew, as it. So with the rise of Hebrew, there is the rise of a whole body, massive body of literature to accompany the revival of Hebrew in the 20th century. And that doesn't just mean uh, translations. And that, that, the, the, the translations of all the major classics of Western and Eastern literature into Hebrew is a huge enterprise that's still going. But within Hebrew itself, generic to Hebrew, we see the rise in the 20th century of modern Hebrew poetry and the modern Hebrew novel, and so on. These are major, major topics. And within this, women are playing a significant part, and I need, obviously, to talk about a few of the most significant Hebrew poets, women Hebrew poets, because they are 
at the absolute front row of the rise of Hebrew poetry. Some of them will be familiar to you, and when, as I say, you're sitting around those dinner tables and the subject of uh, Hebrew poetry of the 20th century and women writers in Hebrew poetry comes up, there are two or three names that if you don't know them, you're going to look uh, embarrassed. <laughs> so these are the names that you would need to know. If we were to pick one, I can guarantee you that if I did a straw poll right here, of those of you who are familiar with any of the famous, famous Hebrew poets of the 20th century that are women, there would be one that would come out, and that one would be... Oh, thank God someone said it. Thank God someone said it. Very, very good. Very good. Right? That, of course, would be Rachel. Uh, and Rachel, uh, she wasn't just born as Rachel. Now, the reason, the reason you know Rachel, the reason Rachel is known is because Rachel's poetry, I studied Rachel's poetry for year 12 for my Hebrew matric. Right? That is, and in Israel, it's, Rachel's poetry is compulsory on the curriculum. And, it's, it, and so it is. Anyone who sits an exam at any level of Hebrew literature will inevitably be given to study a poet of Rachel. Rachel was, of course, Rachel uh, Bluestein, and she was born in Europe, born in, in, in Russia, but her, she came, she developed, I mean, she was born around 1890, uh, and she developed a kind of a, a Zionist yearning as a young girl, and already by the time she's 19, she travels with her sister, they're supposed to be going on a sightseeing tour of Italy, but uh, they arrive in Palestine and they don't leave Palestine. Once she gets to Israel, she just falls in love with the place. She's always wanted to be in Israel. She's always, or Palestine, she's always wanted to be part of that yearning of the Jewish people for their homeland, etc., etc. Russian Jews seem to have caught that bug particularly bad at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. So she's, so it's about 1909 and she rocks up and she's living in Rehovot, and uh, she's been dabbling in poetry, and now she decides to not only write poetry, but she's meeting some of the major figures of the Zionist movement, some of its intellectuals, some of its creatives. You know, Bialik's like still running around, A.D. Gordon, she meets, she dedicates her first poem to him, and so on. So, and then she has this major love affair, a romance, and a love affair, and writes quite a few poems about this, this man and this love affair although it didn't last. It was a very sad thing for her because it didn't last. His name was Zalman Rubashov. And anyone know who Zalman Rubashov is? Who did he go on to become? He went on to become Zalman Shazar. Yes. Later, obviously, president of the State of Israel, one of its greatest presidents. Uh, so, but as a young man, 1909, he and Rachel were having this thing. That didn't last. And Rachel was convinced more or less by her mentors that uh, she should go and uh, study something so but there was nowhere really in Palestine where she could effectively study so she decided to study agronomy which you know agricultural uh, processes and drawing because she was interested in art and she went to Toulouse in 1913 first world war breaks out uh, she ends up having to go back to Russia because she can't get to Palestine uh, and very, very difficult. She waited f till 1919. She got the first boat out of Russia back to Palestine. They were the hardest years for her, not only because she, all she wanted to do every day was just get back to Palestine. Uh, and she was working with refugees. She was enduring very, very hard conditions. But during that time, she also tragically uh, contracted the tuberculosis uh, that would eventually kill her very young. But she got back to Palestine around 1919, 1920. But when her tuberculosis developed, she was living in Kibbutz Taganya. They basically told her she had to leave the kibbutz because she was going to start infecting people. And she went and she lived a very, it's very sad reading the life of Rachel. She's still pumping out poems and people are still reading her poems and going, wow, that's amazing. But uh, she uh, was living this incredibly poor, absolutely nothing existence in some shack in Tel Aviv on the edge there, was barely able to uh, survive. And uh, she was also sick and whatever, and she traveled around a bit, but uh, she died actually in 1930, and she was only 40 years old. 
Uh, but her poetry is so frontline because it, it's not simply someone who says, oh, I'll go to Israel, I'll learn Hebrew and I'll write some poems. She was at the forefront of the sim, what they call the symbolist movement in the development of Israeli poetry, which was reflecting different intellectual trends in poetry that was happening in Europe and so on, getting back to very, very elemental descriptions in words, a movement away from flowery language towards much more pure form of, of poetic symbolism. This is she, she, Intellectually as well as artistically, she's right at the forefront of, uh, of, of the world poetry at the time and is one of the major contributors to the revival of Hebrew poetry. I can't speak much more about Rachel, but, well, we could go into the type of poetry she's writing, which I will come back to Rachel in a moment, because someone else later is going to take her poetry and put it to music. So, um, The next person we would probably talk about, uh, I can't talk for more than two minutes, because otherwise you go below the surface in this person, and it's quite deep, but uh, Leah Goldberg. Leah Goldberg. So Leah Goldberg, she makes Aliyah also around 1925, I think, is when she comes. She's born in 1911. And Leah Goldberg, from a very early age, is an absolute Eloi. She's absolutely brilliant. And in fact, she gets a... No, 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 1935 she makes Aliyah because she, she gets a PhD in Berlin first. You've got to understand, these, peop- these girls were born in Russia, right? Where they're learning Hebrew. Where they're learning Hebrew. When Rachel gets to, I'm going to give you a Muslim. When Rachel comes to Israel, she doesn't know any Hebrew. There were, you could do classes in Russia. You do classes in Russia. But as people were finding two things, one is that the classes were very sporadic. And secondly, because, and certainly after the Bolshevik Revolution, they were almost impossible. And also because the Hebrew that was being spoken there was not necessarily relating to the Hebrew that was being developed in Palestine at the time. It's the same language, but first of all, the pronunciation was different. And so but Rachel learns her Hebrew from hanging around helping in the kindergarten. So she learns from children. This is someone who goes on to become the greatest Israeli poet. She learns from children. And similarly, Leah Goldberg, how does she, she teaches herself. She teaches herself. And then she goes, well, let me, I mean, when we talk about, ah, oh, Hebrew is a bit difficult. Da, 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 da. These women are driven and they want to have an involvement in this incredible new, uh, I think some of us, all of us perhaps, because of who we are and where we are living and when we are living, we sometimes forget that there was entire sections of the Jewish world at the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, that thought it was nothing short of amazing that people were going now to live in Palestine, to rebuild the land of Israel, to revive the Hebrew language. This kind of amazement in the whole story of the 20th century in Jewish history is kind of a bit lost on us now. The state of Israel is nearly 70 years old, it's a given fact. And defended ourselves against our enemies. We're a reality in the world. Everyone else can go and shove it as far as we're concerned. Since 1967, we've had Jerusalem, whatever. Hebrew is a given language now in Israel. These are astonishing facts. So it was astonishing to people. So they're driven towards it. So Leah Goldberg uh, gets to Israel and, and uh, takes on various... She had a different kind of life from uh, someone like Rachel because... Uh, news of the fact that this frontline Hebrew writer and intellectual was coming to live in Palestine was already known by the time she got there so she was like the roads were opened and she was given a series of positions prizes and so on it became a major major contributor to the whole she uh, translates she becomes a translator as well she translates war and peace into Hebrew which was a huge monument right But, 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 you know, I'm just telling you this because in Israeli society of the 20th century, it was a given. It was a given that women are completely equal to men intellectually. It's It's not even a, you know, not even a discussion. And so the fact, oh, yeah, Leah Goldberg translated War and Peace. Fine, let's move on. So it's, uh, and, and these women were not only afforded opportunities, it's true, but they were driven to become who they are. All right. 
I want to talk about uh, this woman. Uh, is a, I don't know, you'd have to be reasonably on top of uh, Israeli poetry, but if you knew anything about Israeli poetry, well, not anything, but a little bit more than anything, you would have come potentially across a poet called Eli Sheva. Anyone heard of Eli Sheva? You've heard of Eli Sheva. What do you know about Eli Sheva? She's good. Yes, yeah, she's very good. She's very good. Right? But do you know anything else about her that's interesting? Well, her name is Elisheva Bichovsky. She's known as just Elisheva. In fact, she used to sometimes sign her early works as E. Lisheva. But she wasn't born as Elisheva. She was born as Elizaveta Ivanovna Zirkova. And uh, she was not Jewish. She was born Russian Orthodox. And she grew very, very interested in Jewish culture, Jewish spiritual life, and Jewish languages, Yiddish and Hebrew. In fact, when she first started reading things, and she started reading newspapers by herself, she didn't realize there was a difference between Yiddish and Hebrew for a while. But that was useful for her because she was able to work out how to read the letters and so on. And only after a while did she realize that actually there are two completely different languages. And so she sought out in Moscow some of those classes and circles that were discussing Hebrew. She writes at great lengths about the different types of teachers that she had, the good ones, the bad ones, the ones who were less than good teachers, the ones who tried to uh, molest her, the ones that were this, the ones that were that. It was a very, very strange society, Moscow at the time. One of her teachers, she thought this guy was really, really good, but he got sacked because he was uh, going around Moscow in a summer overcoat and no galoshes when it was raining, and that was regarded as scandalous. So he was uh, sacked. And then, uh, you know, other things. Anyway, she eventually marries one of the guys hanging around these circles, a called Shimon Bechovsky. And in the 1920s, they eventually emigrate to Palestine. Yes, Shimon Bukhovsky was Jewish, Jewish, but they had to get married in a civil wedding. They got married in Russia in a civil marriage because they, a Jew couldn't marry a non-Jew in, a, in any sort of marriage. So they got, and they came to Palestine and they were interested. Now, the thing is, it's very, very difficult when you read, Eli, and she's writing poetry, she's pumping out Hebrew poetry. By now she is a seriously regarded and respected Hebrew poet, and she's pumping out poetry. But the problem is, is, and it's very difficult to read her biography, those of you who want to go into uh, Eli Sheva Bachovsky's biography, because after Shimon died, and it's a bit of a disgraceful episode really, uh, after he died, she was basically neglected by uh, the society that she had tried to become a part of. And she also lived out her last years in tremendous poverty as well and in fact at some point she was even working in a laundry to try I mean this is someone who a few years before had been heralded as uh, this great poet and I don't exactly know why that she never converted to Judaism this is not like Nahida Ruth she never converted to Judaism but she was what you might call a convert to Zionism she was deeply passionate about the Jewish people and about their homeland and about the Hebrew language. And she is buried uh, near Rachel. There was a whole discussion when she died about where she could be buried because she wasn't actually Jewish. And then there were some interventions at the high level and they buried her at uh, the cemetery at Kvutzat Kineret, which overlooks the, the Sea of Galilee where Rachel is buried and a number of other major poets are buried. So you can go there and on her tombstone is just written uh, Eli Sheva. And she said, and her poetry is at a different, a completely different type of poetry from the poetry of Rachel and Leah Goldberg. They, those poets were mirroring some of the major intellectual movements in literature at the time, whereas Elisheva was totally off on her own uh, trip. And uh, actually, her poetry uh, attracted quite a lot of criticism from more snobby kind of literary critics and so on, because it was too, they regarded it as too basic and too unreflective and whatever. But uh, certain recent reassessments of Elisheva's poetry has shown us that there's phenomenal depth there and a passion and, and a loneliness and a yearning that, that no other poet can capture. So if you get a chance to look at Elisheva's poetry, either in translation, but even, even better in Hebrew, those of you who can do that, you will see what I mean. There's something kind of unique about Elisheva's poetry that you don't see anywhere else. All right. 
those would be the three major poets of the Hebrew poets. Now, I know that some of you might be saying, oh, I can't believe we spent all that time just on Hebrew poetry. What an uninteresting topic. But these women are seriously at the forefront. They're not just also rants. These are the founders of Hebrew poetry of the 20th century. I'm going to add one more, although she's not technically a poet, although she has written her own poetry. She wrote her own poetry. But that, of course, is the amazing, and I think she's amazing, and some of you might share that, Naomi Shemer. Uh, Naomi Shemer, who passed away, I think, in the early 21st century. Naomi, why is Naomi Shemer famous? Naomi Shemer fam is famous because she penned the song Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold. Naomi Shemer, some of her other songs, she quite often took the poems of Rachel. No one refers to Rachel as Rachel Blusen, by the way. Everybody refers to her as just Rachel. That's how she's known, Rachel. She took some of Rachel's poetry and set them to music. But Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, which was written and, and performed for the first time, by the way, a month before the Six-Day War, and after they captured the Kotel, is she wrote another verse. And it's, it's kind of like become the second anthem of Israel. Yeah, Yerushalayim Shil Zahav. It's probably the most well-known song, Jewish song of the 20th century. I'm going to make, and there's a, if you look at the words of Yerushalayim Shil Zahav and you know Jewish history and you know Jewish literature, there are so many incredible cryptic references in there to various facets of Jewish history. It's really quite an astonishing text. And I'm just going to mention one of them because it relates to something we talked about weeks and weeks ago in this series. The whole concept of Yerushalayim Shel Zahav. What does Yerushalayim Shel Zahav mean? Jerusalem of gold. If you recall, if you recall, when they were very, very poor, Rabbi Akiva said to his wife Rachel when they were talking about how they had to give the straw of their own mattress to a poor couple that were having a baby and they had nothing else to sleep on he said one day I will buy you a Jerusalem of gold to put in your hair Remember, did anyone remember I talked about that? And he eventually bought her, when he became very successful and very wealthy, he bought her a diadem which was like in the shape of Jerusalem, a Jerusalem of gold. And that is a direct reference by Naomi Shemir uh, to, in Yerushalayim Shel Zahav. So uh, I kind of wanted to bring that because it kind of ties uh, in, in those features. Uh, so Naomi Shemer, very, very famous Israeli songwriter and lyricist and singer and someone that is worthy of a mention. I just want to uh, make sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, I, I know where I want to get up to. I know where I want to get up to in the break. And we, we should make it because I've just got to talk about uh, uh, two or three more women writers. Some of you who are going, oh, why hasn't he mentioned her? Why hasn't he mentioned her? This person I need to mention because I, I don't know whether it's here or the evening class. Someone was um, amazed that I didn't mention this person last week. But I think that they probably belong more in this week. Uh, and that is Gertrude Stein. Look, Gertrude Stein is a complex figure. I don't need to tell you that. Well, let's just go over her basic stuff. I mean, she's born in America. And as a young woman makes her way to Paris. And really she's very I'm much more identified with the whole scene that was going on in Paris in the first few decades of the 20th century. And that scene, if you're in that scene, was really all about art and literature. And everyone knew everybody and there were these incredible salons. Of, I mean, I, I, her most famous book, which is The Life of Alice Toklas, and you read that and she talks there about the fact that, oh, and one day, <laughs> I mean, it's funny because all of us, if you, know, if you had a time machine and you could go back in time to one point purely for the purpose of making money, right? I mean, she writes about the fact that, oh, and then so-and-so was telling us about this artist called Cezanne 
and we went there and he was complaining that he had offered to to uh, sponsor Cezanne and to show his works but no one was buying his paintings would she come and have a look please and to work and maybe buy one or two paintings of this poor fellow right so you can imagine going to a Paris where no one was buying Cezanne's paintings and she was friends with Picasso and she was Picasso painted the famous portrait of her and so she was part of the, and of course she was in a deep lifelong relationship with amazingly another Jewish girl from America called Alice Toklas and that was the her in fact her first really 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 big book which is uh, an autobiography of Alice Toklas is written by Gertrude Stein and it's really about Gertrude Stein but it's kind of through the eyes of Alice this demure shy Jewish girl that also had found herself in Paris and she and Stein developed this lifelong relationship. Stein is problematic, some of you may be aware, because she died in 1946 and she never left Paris. And so you say, well, how does that happen? How does someone survive? How does a Jewish person survive Paris from 1940 to 1946? And we're seeing Everybody else. I mean, look, last week we spoke about Hannah Arendt, right? I mean, as soon as the Germans are coming into France, people are, you don't want to be around. And yet Stein remained in her apartment with her art collection intact, with her everything, with Alice, right throughout the war years. And that has got a lot to do with the fact that she was highly connected with and in many ways defensive of the whole Vichy regime. There are many, many... Look, it's very, you, you know, to go over historical figures and start throwing accusations and judgments and asking questions is very, very difficult for us. Sometimes it's necessary to raise those questions, but we can't always answer for people. But, you know, on the day that they deported, you know, 75,000 children from Paris uh, to the camps, and uh, how, how do you not know about that? How do you go about your life uh, your salon artistic effervescent existence uh, and not be aware of what's going on around you simply because you happen to be sufficiently connected uh, that you're in a sense protected. Very, she came in for some very difficult criticism for that and, but she, she is nevertheless a significant writer of the 20th century, a novelist. The next person I want to talk about might be known to some of you. This is a phenomenal story and we don't really have time to go into it, but I want to talk for a couple of minutes about Irene Nemirovsky. Oh, good, 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 good. Because I think that she's amazing and in fact she's kind of like the a kind of a counterbalance to Gertrude Stein, although not really. I mean, uh, Irene Nemirovsky, who is a Jewish woman who herself found herself, you know, living much of her life in Paris and decided to write and became this incredible writer. She's compared to some of the greatest writers in France by people that now know her work. She was incredible, but of course, and wrote a couple of novels and whatever, and she was writing poetry, novels, and then the Nazis came and they, so she tried to run for Paris, but the family was arrested, she and her husband and her, their two daughters were arrested by the Gestapo and in fact already in 1939 she had they had converted to uh, Christianity that was seen by some people as perhaps a safeguard against what was going to happen it didn't help and she the family was captured and one of the gendarmes that had captured her said to the two girls right the two girls uh, when mummy and daddy were arrested the two girls said what's happening with us right can we go home and get some things and they were only little girls I'm talking like I think they were like six and nine or something and one of the gendarmes said to the two daughters of Irene right go home get some things and then run and they did and they escaped the war they escaped the fate of their parents Irene died in Auschwitz within a few days of arriving, as we understand it. And the girls, in their haste, going back to the house to get a few possessions, grabbed their mother's writings, the manuscripts, and they put them in the case and they took them with them. The war finishes, the girls go and live in different places, America, so on. And the girl who had 
the writings for years kept them in a drawer and could not look at them because it was too painful to look. She thought they contained basically her mother's diary and her thoughts and her last words and whatever. And it's only in the 1990s that, that someone actually looked at this, a publisher looked at them and realised that what was actually in there were two novels, amazing, phenomenal novels about the 20th century and about what had been happening uh, with Jews in France and so on. And of course, one of those novels was published as uh, Sweet Francais and that uh, became an extraordinarily um, regarded novel and all sorts of prizes were awarded to Irene Nemirovsky, but not until 2004, 2005. They, I mean, they made a film and so on. And so this is, a, this is a remarkable story about a remarkable woman that had the war not come along, would have been actually right at the forefront of French literary life. Really quite astonishing. And then, of course, the last one, and I'll just finish on this and then we'll have a break. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about this person, but, of course, if we're talking about Jewish female writers of the 20th century, then we would have to mention Anne Frank. And the story of Anne Frank, as one of the most famous Jewish uh, females of the, of the 20th century, if not perhaps the most famous, really, in some ways, and perhaps she should have been in last week's talk, but I'm putting her in this category of uh, amazing uh, women writers of the 20th century, not through necessarily trying or designing to be a great writer. I mean, Anne was only uh, 15 or 16 when she died uh, in the Holocaust, but her work, has, uh, her work will survive uh, time beyond just about any other writer of the 20th century because her experiences as a child in Amsterdam with the occupation of the Nazis and is uh, a story that is universal in the spiritual fight against uh, tyranny and oppression. And Anne Frank doesn't need much more for me to say about it, and I'm sure all you're all familiar with it. But those three are a unique group of writers, interestingly, all writing around the same time and affected by the war and reacting to the war in different ways. So let's take a break. When we come back, it'll be a little less heavy. We've still got a lot of amazing women to talk about and we're going to go back a bit in time and then forward. I'm asking everybody to come back and sit down for two more minutes. I'm, I'm very, very sorry. If I don't speak about this person for two minutes, we won't be able to do after the break. And, I, and some of you are actually going, I can't believe you didn't mention this person. I promise you will only take two minutes. Everybody just wants the bathroom and a cup of tea. I'm aware of that. But give me two minutes, right? Because if we're talking about writers... This is, I'm holding 25 women in my head. You have to understand that. If we're, talking about, if we're talking about writers and poets, and really, let's talk about poets, because I knew, as I'm telling you this, there's a poet I knew I hadn't discussed. And please give me two minutes, because this is so important, right? And of course, Hannah Sennis. And the amazing thing about Hannah Sennis is that if she is really... Uh, not only an, a very interesting poet, but she is, of course, S-Z-E-N-E-S. -E -E it's a Hungarian surname, Jewish surname. Uh, she is, of course, probably the most uh, famous, one of the most famous martyrs in I Israeli or Jewish military history of the 20th century. She was, in fact, a poet since childhood, and she loved Hebrew. Her family came from Hungary. She was born in 1921. So there's a very good chance that had not happened, she would still be with us. You never know. But she, um, uh, they came, she came to uh, Palestine in around 1940 uh, and despite being a poet, immediately got involved in the whole, you know, setting up of Jewish society in Palestine and, of course, joined the Palmach, the early military and so on. Uh, the really key thing about Hannah is that she was one of a number of Jewish paratroopers that were parachuted into Hungary in 1944 in an attempt to save Hungarian Jewry from being sent off to Auschwitz. This is, this is an act of phenomenal bravado. What You've got like three quarters of a million Jews in Hungary. They're under threat of deportation and you send in 37 commandos. Now that could have been amazing had it uh, managed, but unfortunately by the time they got there it was already too late and Hannah famously uh, was captured. She was actually one 
of the uh, commandos who insisted that they could try and continue in some form the mission. The others wanted to disband it because it was already pointless. She said, no, we have to do something. But she was captured. And for weeks they tortured her. They found on her the British radio, British-made radio with which to communicate with other. They joined up with a partisan group and they, they wanted to know the names of her collaborators, the names of the other people in the partisan group, the names of the other commandos, what the frequencies were on the radio, how they could contact them. She, apart from her name, she never gave up one piece of information and they tortured her with every conceivable torture every single day and eventually they executed her. Even in her cell, she was writing poetry. There is a poem etched into the wall of her cell. It's a poem that's very, very difficult to read. It's about how she thinks she's lost. She rolled the dice and looks like she's lost. And who knows if she'll ever see the warm sunshine again, etc. It's a very difficult poem to read. But phenom- very, very fascinating poet. And, and just a person of immense courage and dedication and... Uh, who, who knows how any of us would have reacted in that situation, but just uh, so, so kind of like a, a parallel. So, uh, Martha is a soldier and a poet. Uh, ha- Hannah Sandish, who we could talk about a lot more, but is someone that I needed to mention. Let's have a break. You're listening to Collected Talks of David Solomon. Your support can really make a difference. If you enjoy these lectures, please consider rating or reviewing this podcast or simply telling others who may be interested. Now, let's get back to the lecture. This next part, which I really have a lot of women I want to try and get through before the end, is really a different kind of concept. I want to start looking now at a very particular subject that I think is important going forward. So the last half of of this last talk, I want to actually identify a theme, and that theme will be of interest to some of you, not to all, but it's it's worthy of talking about nonetheless, uh, because uh, there have been some incredibly important developments and contributions in the Jewish world in the last hundred years, precisely towards the religious status of women in Judaism. I think that those of you who've sat with me through all these seven talks will know that the ultra-conservative, orthodox perspective on the role of women in Jewish religious affairs is uh, completely out of place with the major tenets of Judaism and uh, as it has unfolded historically and is at variance with what we have seen at different times. Every facet of history has shown that women can rise to the highest levels uh, not just intellectually or creatively but in fact in terms of their input into uh, the religious and the spiritual dimensions of Jewish life. And that, of course, is something that has been fully reappraised in the 20th century. Uh, I I pointed to the work of of Nahida Ruth Remy Lazarus. It's not like she was calling uh, for uh, female rabbis, quite the opposite, but she was calling for uh, a deeper understanding, even by women themselves, of of the spiritual role of women in Jewish life. But for many women, that's not enough. Many women feel alienated by the traditional, in some places and times, traditional lack of educational opportunities give to women, given to women and certainly the opportunities for women to fully express themselves at the highest levels of rabbinic leadership and let alone uh, in religious services and so on. Anybody who's ever been to a shul and uh, sat behind a mechitza and uh, looked at the unfolding of a religious service that is primarily uh, by men and for men is and, and feels excluded as a result of that because they want to participate in the synagogue and they want to participate in communal life uh, will know what I mean. That is a complex discussion. It's a complex discussion. It's not simple. But in an age where gender is in a sense being broken down and the opportunities afforded to people in, in religious and communal life, these are important issues. So there's two or three women I want to look at. The first woman I want to look at was mentioned to me in the break. And in fact, I, it's not in the notes because I didn't think of it before. But you mentioned it to me and I'm going to touch upon her briefly. It is, of course, Sarah Schneider. I think that's how you spell it. There's different spellings. She, she's born in Poland 
in the late 19th century, 1883, but after the war, after the First World War, she's a student of Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, the famous German rabbi. She was a, a devotee of his writings and thoughts, and she believed passionately, as a result of her own experiences, that women, girls, who were going to become women, uh, deserved a far superior Jewish education than the one that they were currently receiving in Europe at the time, and she started a uh, kindergarten, and from there she started a network of girls' schools called Beis Yaakov, uh, that is now a very famous chain of orthodox uh, schools, right up to high schools, right throughout America, Israel, and other places. And Beis Yaakov became kind of like a byword for uh, women to receive not just a high school education per se, but a proper, solid Jewish education, not a Jewish education that grew up on misperceptions and just very, very basic superficial knowledge because that's all women needed to know, but a proper textually driven uh, Jewish education. Now that's still very much within the Orthodox world. It's not like girls there are being taught Talmud and no one's being encouraged to become a rabbi, but they are given a proper Jewish education. And so that's, uh, that, that, that's a huge contribution. Yeah, 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 secular as well. Yeah, secular as well. So on the one hand, it affords them a high school education, but the emphasis is almost, it's like a, a yeshiva college type arrangement, but for girls. And it was aimed at giving girls a much better level of education. The other, a uh, couple of women, one that I'm just going to talk about briefly, because um, it's her, who is familiar with Lily Montague? So Lily Montague, British, very, very well born, semi kind of well-to-do aristocratic family. In fact, her, her cousin was Herbert Samuel, who became a governor of Palestine and so on. And she grew up in a well-to-do household, given a good education in a very traditional Orthodox home where the values of Judaism were much impressed, especially in terms of philanthropy and doing good and whatever, but constantly, constantly frustrated by her lack of access to the experiences and religious events that boys and men were participating in and seriously felt hampered in her ability to express herself and also in the outlook of Judaism that was emerging in some of the more uh, sectarian ways. She believed uh, that religion really is uh, in a sense a personal relationship between a person and God but it should, it, so it's very particular but it should have a universal outlook and ultimately, a bit like Mendelssohn would have argued, that the value of a religious life is uh, really understood by the way that one acts and by the way that one lives and her outlook was immensely universal. Anyway, as a result of all these frustrations, being a very, very talented woman and a very, very well-connected woman, she began what was going to go and become liberal Judaism in the context of British life. Reform is a whole other thing in Germany and America, but in the English context it was known as liberal Judaism, but also instrumental in starting what went on to become the World Union of Progressive Judaism, of which I think she served as its first president and so on. So a very, very instrumental figure. But she herself remained pretty orthodox and traditional all her life, similar to the way Mendelssohn had in the 18th century, but was very much a proponent of dynamic changes within the Jewish world. And in fact, if, if we can't affect it within what's known as the Orthodox world, then there has to be some way in which we can affect these changes. And if it means starting a whole new mode of Judaism, and that's a very sensitive point in the early 20th century, when, uh, especially after the First World War, when these things really start getting going. We kind of take progressive Judaism for granted today, but it had a very, very complex and difficult history and Lily Montague's involvement in it. She's a fascinating figure and sat on just about every conceivable philanthropic board you can think of in the UK and of, obviously she was decorated by the, you know, by the royalty and so on and very, very established and respected figure. Obviously, obviously not without her privileges in life, but used those to uh, raise the cause of women, to alter the course of Jewish history to really uh, single-handedly affect those things is really quite amazing. And the other, another woman that I want to talk about in that sphere early on, early on, this woman is remarkable, 
remarkable for several reasons, because she was remarkable, but also remarkable because she may not have been known, if not, one, a bit like Irene Nemirovsky, she may not have been known except for later historical circumstances that suddenly realised who she is. And I'm wondering if how many of you have heard of this person. Uh, she is Regina Jonas. She is the first woman to be ordained as a rabbi in Germany. When I say ordained as a rabbi, she was working within the framework of uh, reform or progressive Judaism. We're not yet at orthodox rabbi, women rabbis being ordained at this point, but she was a brilliant student and she was enrolled, they allowed her to enroll in the rabbinic academies in Berlin at the time, in the 30s. They accepted women, but all the women that were studying there were studying to get teaching qualifications, but not rabbinic qualifications, but she persuaded them to allow her to be enrolled in the rabbinic program and she went right through the rabbinic program and when she got to the end of the rabbinic program, including having written a thesis which was required for rabbinic uh, appointment, she wrote her thesis on the subject of can a woman become a rabbi? She wrote her dissertation on that and her dissertation was marked and was approved and whatever and yet and it was, a, it was a dissertation based on traditional sources, halachic sources, Talmudic sources, and she argued quite cogently that women can become ordained as rabbis. The thesis was passed, but when it came down to it, no rabbi at the academy would ordain her. Even at the highest levels, you know, Leo Beck and these guys, they were saying, no, 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 it would cause far too much contention with the Orthodox and so on if we ordain a rabbi. And eventually, eventually, one liberal rabbi in Germany gave her ordination. And so she kind of became the first female rabbi. And then the Nazis came. And everybody, of course, all the intellectuals were shipped off. And she spent quite some time, maybe even a year or two, at Theresienstadt. And Theresienstadt was not, at that stage, a death camp. It was a labour camp. And a number of intellectuals, even amongst those who survived the war, were actually uh, at Theresienstadt. And at Theresienstadt, she gave lectures. And she helped set up a centre to help other people that had just been shipped there. She would regularly go down to meet the trains and to help people who were suffering shock and disorientation when they got off the trains. And there in Theresienstadt, she was with people like Viktor Frankl and other great intellectuals and Jewish minds that were there. And she was highly regarded and she contributed greatly to this centre they set up in Theresienstadt, an education centre where she would give these lectures. I think she gave about 24 lectures in Jewish subjects. And then at some point in around 1944, I believe, she was, uh, might have been early, might have been 42, 42 or 44, she was sent to Auschwitz and where she died. Now, amazingly, none of the people that were with her in Theresienstadt wrote about her at all in their reminiscences and recollections of the war and the labour camps. Frankel didn't. Beck didn't, and none of these, these big guys who uh, became famous wrote about her. And once again, she was kind of discovered by accident later on when some of her writings or references to her were discovered amongst uh, some of the records kept by the Germans themselves. And they then opened up a whole field of inquiry and discovered uh, exactly who she was. Uh, so Regina Jonas is kind of like the first woman ordained a rabbi in the in the 20th century but remarkable and what they've even tried to reconstruct some of her ideas and her thoughts and her writings and so on but a life spent not allowing disappointment and disillusionment to get in her way she constantly strove to achieve this 
this absolute articulation of the fact that women can participate fully in rabbinic leadership. And that is going to be a theme that's really going to <laughs> come back in many ways. But before we go back to that theme, I just want to talk about a woman who is generally regarded as the greatest rabbinic traditional textual scholar of the 20th century. And that, of course, is... Oh, by the way, by the way, just as a matter of... I, I really like the fact that Lily Montagu, right, when she was studying, she really, really wanted to study. Uh, and she found a teacher in London, her teacher in Bible... Uh, so this might mean something to some of you and some not. Her teacher was Rabbi Simon Singer, who is the guy who translated the Singer's Prayer Book. He was her teacher. I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty cool, right? I've always been a big fan of the Singer's Siddur and the translation. Anyway, but the biggest scholar probably of the 20th century in women's scholarship in Torah, orthodox understanding of traditional texts, is without a doubt... Nechama Leibovitz. Nechama Leibovitz was a phenomenon. It's no question. She is the only woman, this is both an amazing, uh, amazingly great thing, but also amazingly appalling thing, but she's the only woman that has managed to achieve a level of uh, respect and non-contempt from the male rabbinic orthodox world. She is regarded universally as a Torah scholar. She was born in 1905. Her brother is, of course, Yeshaya Leibovitz, the famous Israeli philosopher, and they grew up in Germany. Uh, she studied uh, in Berlin, at the University of Berlin, and did a PhD there. She was studying at the University of Berlin at exactly the same time that some of the other greats of 20th century Orthodox Judaism were studying at the University of Berlin, notably Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who went on to become the Lubavitcher Rebbe. These guys were all at the same time as Leibovitz. They were all there. But in, uh, in around about 1930, the day after she handed in her PhD, uh, she emigrated to Israel, where she lived kind of like what was striving to be an ordinary life, but at the same time, she was uh, teaching and her teaching was becoming ever more and more popular. For decades she ran this system where she would stencil a series of questions on the weekly Torah reading to anyone who wanted it and they would write uh, their answers and send them back to her and she would mark every single one individually. This went on even when the number of things that she was posting out were in the thousands. She acquired huge numbers of students and then started, who then started to collate her insights into Torah and ancient commentaries and medieval commentaries and uh, compile them in anthologies and her writings are extensively published and many many people were fortunate many people that I know even I wasn't but many people I know are fortunate to um, have studied directly under her when I was studying in Yeshivot in Israel uh, she was around and there were people I knew that were going to her classes. I just never uh, availed myself of those opportunities. I did avail myself of other opportunities, I can assure you, but that's one that I regret, not having at least gone to her classes. But massive. So it doesn't... And what surprised me always about Nechama Leibovitch is that even if you went to some of the, mo some of the, the most extreme, extremely closed ultra-Orthodox rabbinic environments, you would still be able to mention the name Nechama Leibovitz without having people spit at you, even though she was a woman and a Torah scholar. It was the one kind of, you know, it's a bit like Bruria in the Talmud. So they're saying, okay. So she, and her method was more than just becoming a great scholar in her own right. She revolutionized. She actually revolutionized the entire methodology of 20th century Torah study, going back to the classical commentaries and working out things uh, using just the text. Many people have, have written on that and her extensive influence. Uh, some of you may have heard the famous expression, what's bothering Rashi? Yeah? To, to look at a commentary on a piece of uh, Torah text and ask yourself fundamentally the question, why, what is the question inside that verse that leads to this particular commentator having to say what they needed to say? Uh, it might seem like a very, very simple thing, but it comes back to a total existential microscopic focus on the words themselves 
uh, and on what's in the text. It's a very, very interesting approach and has been immensely fruitful, not just for her students, but right across the, the whole field of Jewish textual study. Can't say enough about Necham It's very, very transformational. And then... Uh, one of the students, one of the students of Necham uh, many, many students, but of her students, one woman you would have to say is the most influential and significant in the promotion of women's rights in Jewish life in the 20th century is, of course, Blue Greenberg. Yeah? I mean, obviously, Blue Greenberg, uh, once again, traditional Jewish home, absolutely everything normal about it except that that's the problem it was normal and she realized that there were experiences that she simply was not having purely and only because she was a woman as a young woman she was allowed by her family to spend a year in israel she's studying you know as girls do today she studied under the hammer labovitz she wanted to stay in israel and continue studying under the hammer labovitz but her family made her come back and was told that's just not something a nice Jewish girl does. She realised that had she been one of the sons in the family, that would have been totally encouraged. As she saw in the synagogue that there were so many different ways in which she was denied input into those experiences. And out of born out of that frustration, she threw herself into a series of researches and lectures and influence. In other words, eventually she founded this organisation known today as JOFA, which is the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance. She has tried in all of her writings and speakings to bring together, basically, is there a way in which we can bridge these two very important movements, Judaism and feminism? Not just women's rights, but active, proactive feminism. Is there a way in which we can bring those two together to create true equality for women without compromising halacha? Is there a way in which Jewish law can work towards that? And she has got this very, very famous saying that has become a dictum for Jofa, right? And do you maybe know what it is? No. Very good. Where there's a rabbinic will, there's a halachic way. Where there is a rabbinic will, there is a halachic way. And much of her writing and thought has been to ground some of the major discussions that are taking place in the Jewish world day by day, even as we speak, things are changing in front of us. When you read the writings of people like Blue Greenberg, right, who is not coming from, it's like, fair enough, Regina Jonas, we, that they can put her in the progressive basket. Lily Montague also, Nahida Ruth, Remy Lazarus, different kind of thing going on. But once you get to the point where you're reading uh, things like Blue Greenberg, you're realizing that she's right. And you're realizing that she represents the future, and it's only a question of when. All right. I want to talk now about three very special women. I really wanted to get here before the end of this series. Three very special women I want to talk about who really belong in a group. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on this because I think it's amazing and very significant. Is that in the 20th century, in the 21st century, we have had three Jewish women in space. And of course, the first Jewish female astronaut, who was in fact the first Jewish American of either gender, was of course Judith Resnick. And Judith Resnick, very, very interesting, oh, very brilliant. And uh, she went on to work for NASA and uh, went in space and then came back in her second space trip was tragically killed on board the Challenger that blew up in 1986 those of us who recall and it was a very tragic end to a very amazing career uh, and she was you know she was young the thing is um the one, one interesting thing about Resnick's legacy and of course many uh, tributes have been paid to her and so on but there is a crater on the moon named Resnick after her and so whereas we looked at an asteroid named after Rachel Varnhagen. There is a crater named after Judith Resnick. I'm not sure if any other Jewish women have a crater named after them. The second, of course, is Ellen Baker. And Ellen Baker is actually interesting, not only because she went into space, Jewish girl went into space, uh, but also because her mother would almost crack this list. Her mother is Claire Shulman. And Claire Shulman was the first woman, let alone Jewish woman, the first woman uh, to become the president, which is kind of like the equivalent of mayor of a major New York City borough. 
So she was the president of Queens for many years, like a huge figure in New York City politics, went on to become the mayor of Queens, basically the, what the, the position is called president, the president of the whole of the city council of Queens, and Queens itself, if it was a city by itself, would be a city of several million people. Mm-hmm. Her daughter, Ellen, went on to become an astronaut and went into space. And the third one, I think, is Marsha Ivans. These two are obviously still alive. And just worth mentioning, because space itself uh, is interesting, and that's also kind of a future direction of humanity going into space. And right from the get-go, we've had Jewish women in space. We didn't have to wait around for decades. Oh, when's a Jewish woman going into space? They were right there from the start. And Judith Resnick was, in fact, the second Jew to go into space. The first was a Russian cosmonaut of, you know, uh, every second Russian cosmonaut is going to be Jewish, whatever, but certainly the first Jewish woman to go into space. Now, at the end of the 20th century, one of those big things did a huge survey on who they regarded as the 20 most powerful and influential business people from the 20th century. And on that list was only one woman. And that woman happened to be a Jewish woman. And it was, of course, Estee Lauder. Now, Estee Lauder, her original name, she was born in, she was born in Queens, and we just spoke about Queens, and so she was born in New York. Her original name wasn't Estee, it was... No, it was Josephine. <laughs> However, however, right, she was only called Josephine at the last minute and her parents were going to call her Esty after her father's aunt, right? And so even though she, they gave her the name Josephine, when she was growing up, she had the nickname Esty. And when she was old enough, older, and I was already after she'd started her whole Emporium range, uh, she, and known as Esti, Esti Lauter, actually. She changed the name to Lauder, yes. and she changed her first name from Esti to Esté, with a little French thing yeah. to make it look whatever. So Esté. Now, she married. She married uh, Joe. Joe Lauder, and she was helping out in the family business. I think her father had, I think it was a hardware store or something like that. And then she was started helping out an uncle who was into making different types of cosmetic creams and so on. And eventually uh, she took over that business from him, but really, really amazingly kind of single-handedly developed. There's, there's, there's one cream in the early days that she called it her super rich for everything cream. And uh, she took that round and uh, everywhere in New York and then eventually got it into some of the big, you know, Saks and Fifth Avenue and some of the big department stores in New York and eventually Harrods in London and eventually built it up. The most amazing turnaround of a product for her was this. Well, I find this interesting. This is going into the kind of history of cosmetics in the 20th century. It's not really my thing. But what I did <laughs> find interesting was the fact that with Estee Lauder is that one of her early products was this realisation that women were wearing perfume and they were taking like one drop and putting it like behind each ear, you know, like that, and they go out on perfume. And she thought, ah, oh, what if instead of selling them something they just use a couple of drops at a time, right? If I sell a product that they use as a bath water, then they'll be using a whole bottle of it at a time, right? And she sold a perfume that could be put into the bath so that you have your bath and your perfume at once and you come out fully fragrant as though this was a 20th century idea. You think that the Romans never thought of this, right? But for her, for the 20th century, this was a chiddish, this was an innovation and sales just went through the roof. This is already in the in the 30s and 40s, by the time you get to the 70s, she's already, uh, in the 80s, she's already Estee Lauder, and her uh, company today is worth literally billions of dollars. I think their turnover last year was something like 11 or 12 billion dollars. It's one of the largest cosmetic companies in the world. All started single-handedly by Estee. Well, now run, well, it took, taken over by Leonard Lauder, and then his son, William Lauder, is now the CEO, I believe. Her other son, Ronald Lauder, who I had the privilege to meet, he, uh, he's, a philanthropist. he's a philanthropist, but also very, very involved in the Jewish world, very involved in Jewish politics. For, he was Reagan's ambassador to Austria. And then Doesn't he have the schools in Poland? He has schools, not only in Poland, he has a, fa- a very big school in Vienna as well. I've taught at that school in Vienna and so on. So, Sorry? 
and Hungary, right across Europe, so there's a louder foundation. But that's all. That, I mean, yes, he's impressive, but really, it's hers. Yeah, it all comes from the immense fortune and influence that, uh, of, of Estée Lauder, who's a remarkable woman and shows, once again, you know, we're talking about poetry, we're talking about going to space, talking about this and all of that, but in the world of commerce, also huge uh, things that have done. Now, I've got two or three minutes remaining, and I just want to very, very briefly talk about something that I put on the end of last week's notes, but I didn't get to speak about it. And then I realised that really this brings us all the way back and can put it um, just at the end. And I realise I've left myself with less than five minutes, but uh, I just want to discuss the 21st century in the light of the theme that I was talking about earlier, about this uh, idea of uh, rabbinic ordination, something that really was at the forefront of the quest of people like Regina Jonas and others, Blue Greenberg has also spoken about this. And towards the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st, there have been some very, very serious moves uh, to try and really, really kind of move this forward, this idea that women can become rabbis, not just in progressive uh, communities and conservative Judaism, but within orthodoxy. There is no impediment to women becoming rabbis other than the resistance of men. And it would appear that the first woman to have been ordained within an orthodox context it didn't emerge till later and it's actually someone who's a friend of mine and i wrote to her last week saying i was going to mention her in one of my talks but if she found out the rest of the company in which she was mentioned in the list she probably wouldn't talk to me again but it is of course a woman called mimi very good mimi fagelson mimi is a hasidic uh, rabbi she's an amazing person amazing intellect very very spiritually gifted a speaker a teacher a counselor she was given smicha by Shlomo Kalbach uh, by Rabbi Shlomo Kalbach the kind of new age mm-hmm. rabbi of the 60s and 70s uh, and she got smicha from him not too long before he passed away I think in the late 80s um, she got smicha from Shlomo Kalbach but it wasn't a fact that was revealed she revealed it in an interview in uh, in the year 2000 and uh, since then people have looked at her as being the first orthodox female rabbi but she wasn't outed as such for quite a while and also um, didn't become as celebrated as the next one which didn't happen until 2006. Now you might say oh, 2006 is only 10 years ago 10 11 years ago but that's that's how recent we're talking we are we are living now at a cutting edge in Jewish history in in terms of these people. Chaviva Ner David Chaviva Ner David was given smicha by a rabbi, an orthodox rabbi in the old city in 2006. What does it mean to get rabbinic ordination? I just, I just want to clarify that for one second. What does it mean? Jewish rabbis are not priests. They're teachers. It, yeah. And they are teachers and they are deciders of Jewish law. They're not priests. They're not given the right to say in the Catholic Church, oh, now you're an ordained priest, you can do sacraments, so you can marry and you can do this. Any, anything like that in Judaism can be done by anyone without being a rabbi. You don't need to be a rabbi to be a mesader kiddush in a to marry someone. You don't need to be a rabbi to run a service. There's no mass by which you have to have some specific ordination. The key point behind rabbinic ordination is to answer questions of Jewish law. It's to be qualified and ordained by rabbis to say, if a person comes to you with a question on Jewish law, are you equipped to provide a direction for them on what they should do. There's also the whole aspect of teaching, because Rav also implies a teacher, but the primary cutting edge of it is on the concept of Jewish law. That is why all the tests for rabbinic ordination, whether they're in the form of direct oral tests or whether they're in the form of written theses or whatever they are, are about answering questions of Jewish law. Are you familiar with the sources? Do you know where to go to find the answers for these types of questions and so on? That's what qualifies a person. So when someone like Haviva Ner David gets qualified as rabbi, it means that she has sat and studied those parts of Shulchan Aruch that are required for study for those seeking rabbinic ordination. You would be amazed at your local rabbi you would probably be amazed at what he does know, but you'd also be amazed at what he doesn't know. Because the sections of Shulchan Aruch that are re- mandated for your most basic level smicha, your most basic level rabbinic ordination, are not that massive. And most of them focus on, in your Yoradea, on questions of kashrut. 
That's what most of them uh, have to do. And funnily enough, we're talking about kashrut, you're, much, you're going to get a much more enlightened answer if you actually ask a woman who deals with kashrut all the time. Um, then we have this massive development in around 2006 that a very bold but nevertheless controversial rabbi in America called Rabbi Avi Weiss begins an academy. Remember, a couple of weeks ago we looked at a Torah academy to train women that was back in Rome in the, in the 16th century. Remember all that? So he opens an academy for women to train women to become rabbis, like a proper full-on yeshiva at level of rabbinic study called Yeshivat Maharat. And in fact, Vice's first, first smicha was given uh, to a woman called uh, Sarah Horovitz. Sarah uh, is now the dean of Yeshivat Maharat. After Sarah Horovitz's smicha, the other Orthodox rabbis, the whole of the Council of Orthodox Rabbis in America went spakactic. All of the Orthodox organizations came down and said, this is a complete departure from Norman of Judaism. You are not to ordain any more women, blah, 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 blah. Um, he reached some kind of some compromise with them, although he resigned from the thing. But Yeshivat Maharat, Avi Weiss, W-E-I-S-S. The Yeshiva Maharat is still going. And I'm going to end on this point, because this point is really about the future. And I'm going to ask you all to do this if you get a chance, if you're remotely interested in this topic. Go to the website of Yeshivat Maharat. It's on the notes. M-A-H-A-R-A-T. Maharat. Yeshivat Maharat. Maharat is the title of the Gita Rabbis. Vice called Horovitz a Rabbah. After the controversy that ensued from that, all of the subsequent ordinees are called Maharat. Uh, but Horovitz retains the Rabbah title. She is the dean of Yeshivat Maharat. Go to the website of Yeshivat Maharat. Have a look at their candidates for ordination, the ones that have received ordination, and even the ones that are in the years coming up. They've got the class of 2017, the class of 2018, the class of 2019. But go to the class of 2014, go to the class of 2015, go to the class of 2012. Have a look at the biographical notes of the women that are getting smicha it will blow you away. There are no men in the world who are as qualified and who are doing what these women are doing. There is no yeshiva in the world that is producing male rabbinic graduates with these kinds of CVs. These women are so many light years ahead that the boys don't even know these things are possible. I'm talking about way, go and find, if you prove me wrong, go and find me where these guys are. Maybe, maybe the only place you might find a similar thing is perhaps Yeshiva University, but even there, now, uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you, not only for coming back today, but for sitting through this seven part, we've looked at the dramatic course of women in Jewish history, right back to the Bible. What we have seen is there is, ideally and in potential, and especially for our generation, no ceiling in Jewish life that women can't break through. Women have been rulers and monarchs and scholars and warriors and prophets and intellects and poets and writers and business people and in every sphere of not just general life but Jewish life itself, women are able to participate at the absolute forefront. That is the message that we are going to take into the future and that is hopefully the message or the idea that has been born out of this very, what's been for me, a very, very enjoyable series on women in Jewish history. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon.